What's up, good people of the 242? How are you this morning? Good to see you. It is great to be back here this weekend in pure Michigan. Love it here. It's beautiful. And I hope you're having an amazing summer. I know that many of you are because some of us are friends on Facebook. And I thoroughly enjoy stalking, I mean, looking over your Facebook post here and there. And I see your family's making memories. Some of you guys are camping and hiking. Others of you have been hitting the lake and the beach, maybe taking in a Tigers game, but making some memories with your family. It's awesome. And we've been doing the same thing back down in Kentucky. My wife and our two boys, we a few weeks ago went out to Los Angeles, got to see my niece graduate from UCLA, cool vacation out there, and came back and spoke at a couple of youth camps and, and doing the same thing. It's been awesome. But for me, uh, summertime is, it's also a season of appointments. Uh, because a few years ago when I turned 40, it hit me that all of this needs some maintenance. And so, <laughs> shut it. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so I, I said, you know, June and July has got to become that intentional time where I schedule all my under the hood kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I go to the doctor for the annual physical. I catch the routine eye exam. Uh, a few other over 40 experiences that are necessary at times. <laughs> and finally, the most dreaded appointment of all for me, the dentist. Anybody with me? Yes. I, I have no idea why at this age I still, that visit wells up within my soul, this level of dread and anxiety. <laughs> and I don't know if you do this or not, but the morning of that appointment, whenever I have it, I get in front of my mirror and I get in the zone. And it is a zone of intensity and great urgency. And I stand there with passion. And I scrub. And I sand. And I floss with rope and chain. And I am convinced that in that moment, I can really eliminate and reduce greatly all the numbers of days of poor dental hygiene practices over the past year. I'm convinced that I can do it. They won't tell. I show up at the appointment. I meet the sweet dental hygienist. I feel like I should apologize in advance for what she's about to have to encounter. And she gets me in that chair, and she's like a NASCAR pit crew. She's in there scraping and chiseling and grinding and flossing and cleaning and polishing. She rams that mirror in my mouth. It's real awkward. I'm like licking the mirror, trying to maintain conversation and drooling on myself. She's done, wipes the sweat from her brow, and then the dentist comes in. Chad, how are you, buddy? How are things going? How's the family? And then he kind of leans down. He holds up this tongue depressor. He says, I need you to do something for me. I need you to open up your mouth and say, ah. So there I am in the chair. I've already been violated for about 45 minutes. And I rear back and I'm like, Rrr. I'm like Chewbacca as the dentist. Big hairy bald guy. Okay, do what you got to do. But in that moment, what's he doing? Well, he's, he's diagnosing me, right? I mean, he's He's getting inside my mouth, and he's, he's looking around to see if there's anything abnormal, like some cavities, gum disease, maybe some mouth cancer. And if in that time, he's looking around. If he would find anything abnormal, he would be very quick to say, hey, this should not be. And that's the same thing that James in the New Testament says. It's the same phrase he uses when he's describing our mouth. Look what he says in James chapter 3, verse 10. He says, out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. And right here, like a skillful physician, James is trying to diagnose the dichotomy of our words. He's saying, there's this crazy thing going on with these words that are coming out of your mouth. He said, out of the same mouth come words of praise and worship, and an hour later, words of crazy profanity. It's wacky. He's saying it's uncanny how out of the same mouth can come words that bless and tomorrow words that bite. That out of the same mouth come words that build people up and two days later just destroy somebody and run them in the ground. All out of the same mouth. And I don't know about you, but I can totally relate to the struggle. My wife and I back in Kentucky, we serve in our children's ministry on Sunday mornings and lead there and have to get there early and do all that stuff. And we have two boys that are 11, 13, and getting them moving on Sunday morning is like a reality show. I feel like we're herding drunk minions out the door, every just trying to go. And last Sunday, I'll just be honest, I lost it. They weren't cooperating. They were just moving slowly. And this is what I said as we're trying to get out the door. I said, I don't care if you've not eaten breakfast or not. Ram a Pop-Tart down your throat and move. If you love Jesus, you'll get in the car. Do you have a pulse, son? Shut it and move. <laughs> and I'm driving the whole way to church, man, and it's just continuing. Machine gun of words. We pull in. 
And up to our car comes a kid I'd been to camp with who had given his life to Christ. And I'm like, just enough! Hey, how are you? I am so excited about what Jesus is doing in your life, man. Praying for you as you begin walking with Christ. Praying for your quiet times. Man, that's awesome. God's good. And I look at my wife and kids, and they're in the car going. (laughs) All out of the same mouth. Like within a span of five or six minutes. Ram a Pop-Tart down your throat. I'm so glad you love Jesus. All out of the same mouth. (laughs) Our words are powerful. Now, if you're just joining us, first of all, we're thrilled that you're here, as Kelly said. And we're in the midst of a series called Life Hacks. And if you're maybe unfamiliar with that term, go home and Google it. You'll find tons of these all over the Internet. But a life hack is something kind of small or maybe a a different approach to something, yet that can kind of make life more simple or things work a little more easy and effective. And uh, Brad, last weekend, he brought the best one I've seen so far involving Doritos. Anybody here for that? Brad taught us that Doritos are flammable and that you can make some killer campfires. Anybody in Michigan blow anything up this week at the campsite? Yes. God bless you. She's like, I did twice. Yes. Awesome. So... I heard Brad do that, I'm like, okay, i got to bring a life hack that's specific to Kentucky. I need to give you a gift this morning in our time together. And so, I don't know for you, like, on the 4th of July last week, if you grill out, you barbecue, but in Kentucky, uh, when you grill, we know that at times, sometimes your grill gets on the fritz, or maybe you don't have a grill. And so down in the bluegrass state, when that happens, this is what we do. This is our our life hack. (laughs) It's, (laughs) It's perfect. you got your... Your beverage is on ice in the back. You got your meat right over the bowl. It's awesome. And a little trivia, this originated actually in Kentucky about 10 years ago with your campus pastor, Kelly Runyon. This was his (laughs) idea, and he's got one in his yard here in Michigan still. Really appreciate that. (laughs) But but no, if you're here this weekend, we're talking about how there's times in life when you and I, we look at people around us and we go, how do they have some things that I don't have? Or how have they accomplish some things that I can't seem to accomplish? And we kind of analyze and we watch and we go, what are they doing that I'm not doing? Like, what's their secret? What's the big idea they've stumbled upon? And that brings me to really what's kind of the foundational truth of this whole series. It's on the screen. We've been saying that, look, it's the small things that no one sees that result in the big things everybody wants. In other words, there's some small yet very intentional changes we can make that can lead to a big difference in our life. And last week we talked about our thoughts. And as you continue to hang with us throughout this series, you're going to see we're kind of building a train I hope you're going to get on and ride. Because we're learning that our thoughts influence our words. And our words influence our actions. Our actions become our habits. And our habits really eventually create our destiny. It's just true. It, it, it's the small things that impact life in a big way. And much of that tweaking begins with gaining control of this three-inch muscle mass in our mouth called the tongue. I did a little bit of research in preparation for the weekend, and one of the things I learned is that the average number of daily words spoken by a man is right at about 20,000 words a day. Okay. I then read that the average number of daily words spoken by a female is right at about 30,000 words a day. Stop. I don't, I'm just the messenger. I'm just sharing the research. Every test reveals the same data time and time again. So I thought, I'm going to share this with my wife, see what she thinks. So I said, hey, Tara, check this out. Did you know that you and most women speak 10,000 more words a day than I do? And I was shocked at her response. She said, Sweetheart, I think that's true. I think that statistic is spot on. And then she said, you know why I think it's accurate? I think it's accurate because all of us wives on this planet, we have to explain everything to our husband at least two to three times so the guy will at least get it or understand it because you don't listen. (laughs) Quit applauding. (laughs) And then she finished it off with something like, you big moron. And I looked at her and I said, Terry, remember, words, Jesus and words. (laughs) Our words are powerful. And the Bible says that our words directed at another person, they can bring life or they can bring death. 
Look what Proverbs 18.21 says. It says, words kill and words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. Key words in that verse. You choose. The Bible's saying whatever words that fly from your mouth or whatever I post on social media, they're our responsibility. They're our choice. Nobody makes us say them. And that brings me to kind of the the foundational piece I want to build on as we hang out together this weekend for a few moments. It's on the screen, and that is this. There's so much truth to this. If you want to begin to change the life you have, James is saying you got to begin to change the words you speak. I mean, if you really want to start seeing change in the life you currently have, you got to start changing the words you speak because our words matter. We make some small changes in our words that can lead to a huge difference in our life. (laughs) But if you're like me, you sit here going, that sounds great, but that's hard. That's how the Bible is. Great to read, a lot of fun, hard to do. It's a challenge because it's a challenge to train and get this muscle called the tongue under control. And we know it is because of what James said here in 310. He said, out of that same mouth, it's a crazy thing, out of that same mouth comes praise and cursing. And as you read the book of James, evidently these people that he's writing to and speaking to, they must have had some serious problems, like some major challenges controlling the damaging words that were just oozing from their mouth. Because as you read the book of James, it's like a constant repeated theme, that just a thread that runs off throughout the book. Look at a few of these verses with me. He, he pleads with his listeners in James 1.19, he says this, he says, Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. He then warns over in James 1.26 and says, Oh, and by the way, those people who consider themselves religious and yet they don't keep a tight rein on their tongues, you know what? They deceive themselves and the religion is worthless. He then asks him this question in James 4.1. He says, Guys, listen, what's causing the fights and quarrels among you? And then he urges them in James 4.11. He says, Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. So all throughout the book of James, it's like he's got a big megaphone going, Hey guys, I need you to open up and say, ah. We need to see what your tongue tells about you. What does your tongue tell about your character, your heart, what's going on on the inside? What's it say about the true spiritual condition of your soul? Because words matter. The Bible's showing us there's a direct correlation between the heart and the mouth. It's all throughout Scripture. And James is saying, look, whatever's currently going on here on the inside, I'm telling you, pretty soon, that same thing's going to be taking place on the outside. Because the heart informs the mouth. I also learned this week that the average American has right at about 30 conversations a day. That doesn't seem like a lot until you think about it. But what that means is you and I, we're going to spend about one-fifth or 20% of our life talking and using words. That's a lot. Uh, To put in perspective, that means in one year, your words could create 66, 800-page books with just your words from the past year. That's uncanny when you think about it. Now, when James was writing this letter, he was only back then talking to people who could only use words in conversation. But if he was going to write this letter again today, he'd have to come from a different angle because of all the ways we now use words in our culture. We don't just say them. Because of technology, we, we text, we chat, we post, we Skype, we, we email, we put things on people's Facebook and Instagram accounts. We have all these ways we use words, and we use them all the time. So what I want you to begin to think about as we're just hanging out together is, what do your words say about you? What, are your, what do your words reveal about your heart? Or what's going on under the hood, inside? Let me throw it out another way. What if today we went over and we picked one of your books off the shelf from the past six months? And we opened it up and we just started reading your conversations, your posts on social media. What would it say about you? Would it be a good read? What are your words projecting about your heart? Because James is saying, guys, the heart informs the mouth. And here it's as if he's like he's really trying to get our attention saying, it is time to go a little deeper and to do an MRI of the tongue. 
Look what he says here in chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. He says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and they're driven by strong winds, they're actually steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. And likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. James is like, here's the deal. We got a bit, a rudder, and a spark. And he says, it's uncanny how you can take this little four-inch piece of metal and put that inside the mouth of a powerful thoroughbred. And you can sit on that horse and direct him exactly where you want him to go. It's uncanny. He says, it's bizarre how you could be the captain or pilot of this giant vessel, this large ship, and sit there with one finger on the wheel, controlling that little small rudder, and send that ship in any direction you choose. He's like, it's crazy how one little spark could fall and touch a piece of dry, fragile ground and in days and months devastate thousands of acres. And equally small, and likewise, is the tongue that has this astonishingly sinister power to do great amounts of soul damage to the very people that Jesus gave his life for. How the same mouth, life-giving words... Or life-taking words. For example, you show me a marriage right now that is limping along and it's struggling. I guarantee when you look inside that marriage, you're going to find a plethora of life-taking words. They're just going to be there. But on the other hand, if you show me a marriage that's growing and it's thriving and it's healthy, and you look inside that marriage, I guarantee you that the farm you'd find an abundance of life-giving words. Because it's just true that if you want to change the life you have, we have to start changing the words we speak. Our words have the power of life and they also have the power of death. So just for a few moments this week, and I want to come alongside of you as a friend and just unpack what I think are a couple powerful yet very simple truths about life-giving words. And if you like to take notes, I want you to get this first one, that is this. If you can't say something helpful, skip it. (laughs) If you can't say something helpful, skip it. And I know you look at that and you go, who is this guy they brought in? I mean, that's not deeply academia or spiritual or highly theological. Kind of sounds like a combination of my mama and Mr. Rogers, but it's just true. I mean, Paul hits the nail on the head in Ephesians 4.29. He says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Paul's saying this, look, if the words that you're about to speak are potentially life-taking, shut thy mouth. That's King James Version. It's in there. Look it up. (laughs) Just shut it. But the challenge is you and I, we live in a culture, let's just be honest, that gives no thought to what we say or what we post. We just let it fly. Words matter, but yet we get behind the keyboard. Send. We send that email. We post away on social media without any thought on the front end of what could happen. Pretty apathetic about any potential damage on the back end of it. That's just how we roll. I mean, is there anybody in this room that wakes up every morning going, what a great day today's going to be. There are power in my words. And today, in the name of Jesus, I have the power to give life to other people with my words. (laughs) Glory to God. Anybody? Three of you, and you're lying in church. We're glad that you're here. Come back next weekend. Come on. We just don't give it much thought. That's our culture. And I saw it this weekend on what my mom calls the Facebook. My mom's on social media now. I love the Facebook. I I tweeted. I tweeted a poke. No, stop talking, Mom. Just stop. But I got on Facebook, and on Monday, on July 4th, I saw one of my friends who it was obvious one of her neighbors was getting under her skin. He was preparing for his big old fireworks extravaganza and trying to dominate all the parking in their subdivision. And she was a little bothered. This is her post from this past Monday. Look carefully what it says. She says, okay, so the rude neighbor who lives on the corner who looks like the cool ghoul and lights fireworks off like an idiot posted his yearly signs outside that say no parking, fireworks zone. He blocks off a huge portion of the streets for his benefit. Well, then her friend gets in on it and has to chime in with her two cents. Her friend says, girl, does he have a permit from the city? 
If not, I'd call the police on his beep rear end. I have a neighbor I'd like to choke the life out of. She's called the cops at least 10 times on us, has lied and said that Chad's friend, I promise it's not me, bumped into her husband's truck. Didn't leave a mark, but she's solid. She's wonderful with punctuation, as you can tell. But it was a total lie. The police beat on her door and told her parents she was involved in a possible hit and run. She told other neighbors she thinks we sell crack. <laughs> she, you can't make this stuff up. She, she says that we're all white trash renters and she won't stop until we move. However, we renters, we have the best looking houses on the street. Mm. She had Halloween decorations still up in December. <laughs> she gonna make me give her a real reason to call the police. This was just on Monday. And it's what we do, right, in this culture. If I'm angry, I let it fly. If you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you more. If we don't agree, look out, bring it. No boundaries. We have endless excuses. Well, I was just kind of tired and really stressed when I said that. Bunch of careless reacting, guns a blazing. And Paul is saying, you all need to slow down and shut up. In Ephesians, he's saying, guys, slow down. Stop. Think. Zip it. <laughs> now, I'll be the first to say I'm as guilty as anyone in this room. I am. I struggle with this. This is a me too kind of sermon. And I do not speak on this topic from any area of expertise, I promise. I mean, this weekend, if you were to pick one of my books of conversations and emails and posts off the shelf, there will be some in there, honestly, that I would just, I wish I could burn. I struggle with it too. As I said, I've got two boys who are 11 and 13 now, and they are early risers, and I hate that. I mean, I, I love it for them because it's going to play into their future well when they're getting jobs and need to get up around the morning. But our home right now, it's pure hell on a Saturday morning when you're exhausted. And they're like, hey, what are we doing today? You know? And so a few years ago, I had to sit them down and say, listen, on Saturday mornings, no one comes in our bedroom before 7 a.m. Don't do it. You come in here before 7, I'm going to throat punch it. Don't even think about it. Don't do it. So one Saturday morning, we'd been up late the night before an event with our church, 5.20 a.m., door opens. It's my youngest son, Cameron. He hops on the bed. I felt like a volcano was just, was just coming. I raised up, and I gave him everything but the Gettysburg address. What are you doing? You know your mom and I have told you clearly, you do not come in this room before 7 a.m. You disrespectful brat. You don't respect authority. What on earth could be so much important? You need to come in here at 5.20 a.m. Come on. I mean, what do you need? And he hung his head and he goes, I just wanted to tell you I'm five today. <laughs> Would you stop? Please. <laughs> I've already spent thousands on counseling and therapy for he and myself. Oh, <laughs> dad of the year. Who's he to teach from the stage? His heart's terrible. Call social services. <laughs> no, I know, I know. <laughs> and I know that in that moment, I heard him on his birthday of all things. And I know my words left a scar. And that's why Solomon says to us in Proverbs 12, 18, he says, the words of the reckless, they pierce like swords. And I love his choice of words there, reckless. Because if I could think of one word that describes our culture and how we use words today, that's the word. We're just crazily reckless. And we all sit here today, and at times you've been on the giving end of those kind of words, me too. And at times, we've also been on the receiving end of those words. And I know that many of you sit in this room right now, and you carry with you some of the scars from some of those words. Those words that were reckless. Those words that stabbed you, and they pierced like swords when they were spoken to you. And so a few weeks ago, I took to Facebook for something actually purposeful for once. And I asked my friends on there this question. I said... What are some life-taking words that have wounded you in some way? It could be recent. It could be from years ago. But they're words or phrases that hurt. They stung. And they've kind of stuck with you. you. You just can't seem to shake them. And I was amazed at how many responses I got private message to me. And I want to share some of these with you and remind you these are real people just like you. But listen to the heartache in some of these phrases that have stuck with grown adults for years. Here's what they said. 
no one will ever want to be with you. That was the worst performance I've seen in 25 years of teaching. You're just not smart enough. You're damaged goods. You're so lazy. Why can't you be more like your sister? I wish you were never born. You and your brother, you were just in the way of me living my life. I'll tell you right now, no one is ever going to want to marry you. Dude, you lost a game for us tonight. And the list goes on and on and on. And I know that most of us have experienced those type of wounds because words, we know it, they have the power of death. Proverbs 18, 21. Look what it says again. It says our words, yep, they can kill. But then it also says that words can give life. Yeah, it says that words can produce poison, but it says they can also bear great fruit. And here's the win for us. You choose. You and I get to make a choice. And we can choose to instead speak words of life. And that brings me to my second principle this morning. And that is if you think something good, say it. Man, by all means, if you think something good, let it fly. Proverbs 15, 4 says, kind words heal and help. And I believe with every fiber of my being that every one of us in this room desperately want to live out that verse. I think we do. I think we're good people and that we really desire to speak words that give life to others. But along the way, life happens, doesn't it? We get tired and we get stressed and we get hurt and we get offended. And then eventually, boom. So let's make this personal for a moment. I want you to think right now of a significant relationship you have. A relationship that you view as vital. It might be your spouse, it might be your kids, your parents. Maybe it's a really close friend or significant other. But think about that person for a moment. And if you can think of one person and you sincerely value that relationship, I'm going to tell you right now. This message for you is not only relevant, it's crucial. Because encouragement is like the oxygen of relationships. Healthy, significant relationships cannot thrive without it. Every relationship needs to constantly be built up. You and I constantly need to hear from people that we matter. As I said earlier in the message, a few weeks ago, my family packed and went to Los Angeles. And as I was packing for that trip, something really struck me. I realized that the way I pack for a trip at the age of 44 is really different than how I pack for a trip in my early 20s. (laughs) My wife and I were first married. We wanted to go somewhere. Walmart bag, cold pairs of shorts, toothbrush, rock and roll. Let's go. At 44, that whole process is now very complex and complicated. (laughs) Because I've got to get my ointments and my creams and my aspirin. And uh, this alone is a picture of my vitamins and supplements. I'm like, do I have my fish oil, my Mega Men's, uh, my Presser Vision eye things? Because glaucoma, you know, it's genetic. And my daily aspirin, my Tums, my Miralax in case I get a little locked up with the flight. I mean, on and on and on. It's a process. It takes time. Because as I've gotten older, there's some things that my body desperately needs that it just can't manufacture on its own. And so i got to reach from the outside to take it in. And isn't encouragement the same way? I mean, we desperately need it in order to survive and thrive. And it's not something we can just manufacture on our own. We need people to give it to us and need us to be giving it right back to them. That's why the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, it says, encourage each other. Give each other strength. I love that word strength because that's what encouragement does. It builds people up. It holds them in tough times. There is a power in life-giving words. It's like a spiritual TNT. Words matter. So I took back to Facebook one last time and asked my friends one other question. I said, what are some words that have brought life to you over the years? Listen to some of their responses. When I grow up, I want to be just like you. You're my favorite teacher. Hey, man, I'm praying for you. Kids, doesn't your mom look beautiful tonight? Good night, princess. You're a great mom. 
played awesome tonight, buddy. Sweetheart, whoever marries you, they're going to be one lucky man. You get prettier every day. You're such a hard worker. I value that. And the list goes on and on. And I pray today that each of you have experienced some of that in your life. That at the right time, the right person said just the right thing and life came to you. There's something powerful when that happens when at just the right time, just the right person says just the right thing and it gives people life. And words can do that. I know they can because they've done it for me. This is my dad. I love my father. In the last five or six months, man, he's faced some major, major health obstacles. And he's the hardest working man I've ever met. His work ethic is off the charts. He's a very stoic individual, speaks about four words a day, very quiet, not highly emotional, not a big hugger, I love you guy, but I know that he loves me deeply. And so because of that, he gave me something when I graduated back in 2000 with my master's degree from Xavier University. He wrote me just a little note of the few words, and I cherish it to this day, and I look at it often. And this is what he wrote to me. He said, Chad, congratulations on being the first person in our family to receive a graduate degree. I love you, son, and I celebrate with you today. And then he ended with this line. He said, I'm more proud of who you are than what you do. Son, I'm more proud of who you are than what you do. And I'm going to tell you right now, my dad could leave me $7 trillion in his will, and none of that would begin to rival the value of the words in that letter. The words matter. So what do we do with this? We come in here, it's the 1030 service, it's packed, oh, we sing, we stand up, we go, what's this tongue to press? We throw some money in, we go grab lunch, and we go on about our day. If we just come in and check a box, it's like, what for, right? So right now, what do we do with this? Well, I want to help you with that this morning. I want you to reach down and actually take out that tongue depressor you received. I know you've been going, who is this weird guy from Kentucky, and what's he going to make us do? Hold that up in the air for a moment. Let's get to the so what of this weekend. Let's do something with this. And as you hold this up, I want to ask you to read with me what I think is kind of the foundational verse for our time together this weekend from James 3.10. It's on the screen. Let's read it out together. Here we go. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. One more time. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. James says, friends, it should not be. He's saying these same lips that just 30 minutes ago sang our great God and sang words of praise and worship, those same lips in the moment shouldn't go home and get in a heated argument with your spouse and drop the F-bomb and just ream them into the ground with your words. He said, this should not be. He says, friends, these same lips that just held up a tongue depressor and receded words directly from Scripture and from the Word of God, those same lips in a moment should not go out in that lobby and gossip about other brothers and sisters in Christ and unfairly criticize this church or go to lunch and just tear up a waiter because my steak's cold. He said, this should not be. So I want you right now to take a marker, pen, whatever you have there. And I want you just for a moment to think about maybe, what's maybe one of the ways that you sometimes damage people with your words not your spouse, no, you. What, what is it for you? Maybe it's gossip, a rumor mill, slander. Maybe it's just speaking harsh words. Maybe you're just a Debbie Downer. Wah, 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 and everything that comes from you is just grumbling and complaining and negativity. Or maybe it's just the absence of encouragement, period. Would you this morning take a risk to get honest? We're all a hot mess in here. (laughs) Just call it for what it is and own it. Just take a moment and write that down on there. And then I want you to flip it over. And I want you to write the name of one person that you could bless this week with your words. Maybe it's a conversation over coffee. Maybe it's a quick letter in the mail or a note. 
Maybe it's something as simple as a phone conversation, a text, an email, post on somebody's wall. But who was somebody this week that you could give them a gift of encouragement that honestly would keep on giving to them for a lifetime? Maybe there's a child whose soul you could fuel up. Maybe there's a spouse whose week you could make. Maybe there's a colleague whose confidence you could build. Who is that for you? Would you take a moment and write that down on the other side? Lock it in with me for a moment as we wrap up. I want you to imagine with me for a moment that on your front porch is a huge stack of $100 bills. I mean, it's huge. It, the value's like up in the millions. And every morning you walk out to get your paper, you look over at it and acknowledge it. It's still there. When you're backing out of the driveway to head off to work, there it is. <laughs> but one morning you're driving out and you look over and you notice that big bare part of the yard and you go, man, I so wish we could do some landscaping over there. Some brushes and some trees, a little stone path found. That'd be sweet. But uh, we just can't afford it. You pull out the driveway, you go a couple miles down the road, and you see your favorite coffee shop coming. You're like, oh, num num. Man, I would love to stop and pound one of those lot of money mochas. Those things are the bomb. But those things, I, I, it's pricey. I, we can't afford that. You go a couple more miles and you get stopped at a light and you look over and there's a brand new shiny Suburban. Sweet. And you're like, we need that. Our family's going, we could use the space, that would be awesome, but we, we can't afford that. That all sounds totally ridiculous, <laughs> doesn't it? And it sounds totally ridiculous until you think about what you and I do in our own lives. Because we have a wealth within our words that's just waiting to be spent on those we value. We're sitting on a wealth within our words that's just waiting to be deposited into the lives of other people. So 242, my challenge for you this week and my so what is that as you get your spiritual rear ends out of these seats in just a moment and we go to eat lunch and you go back home and there's conversations in the car, as you go back to work Monday morning, as you hit the gym, as you're at the park with friends, Hear God saying, 242, take your words this week and make it rain. <laughs> make it rain. Make it rain, baby. <laughs> make it rain. Let's pray.